This video is powered by As Always Entertainment. If you enjoyed this content, consider becoming a patron over on patreon.com forward slash as always. For access to the Patreon exclusive podcast, The Kill Connor Clubhouse, early access to the Cinema Room podcast, being part of polls for future videos, and other early access material. With that said, please enjoy the video. I'm just gonna have to put an end to this. If you like Odyssey, that's cool. I can't stop you, and I don't want to. If you found it as a game you can love and spend hundreds of hours in, I appreciate that, and I hope you continue to. But I need to make this video. I've done my share of Odyssey critique. The main criticism is that it lacks the heart and soul of an Assassin's Creed game, that it fails to accomplish the core pillars of the franchise in social stealth, a complex parkour system and combat that feels gratuitous and is instead replaced with a grindy button mashing mess. It doesn't even focus on assassins, it forces pieces of Eden into contrived quest mechanics, it makes the modern day a parody of the games that had good modern day, it uses the animus all wrong, it skips over huge plot points like Juno and what happened with Layla and William, it fails to utilise Darius correctly and turns him into a walking sales pitch for Assassin's Creed as a brand, and worst of all, it did my boy bike day. Okay, that, that last one was a joke before I get the usual, you just hate Odyssey because Bayek wasn't in it. That's not why. Um, sure, I, I do hate that. Give, give your character sequels, let us invest in them, there's a reason Ezio is still the poster boy, but that's not the reason I hate Odyssey. There's plenty more valid and better reasons. But it's okay they've removed what made Assassin's Creed Assassin's Creed, most people say. I don't care about Assassin's Creed anyway, so for me, personally, this doesn't bother me. At least it's a good RPG, right? Wrong. Assassin's Creed Odyssey is the most false pseudo RPG I've ever touched. Role playing games with my favourite genre of games. Ever since Skyrim, I've tried so many RPGs. Skyrim, Fallout 3, New Vegas, Fallout 4, Mass Effect 1, 2, 3, and Andromeda, KOTOR, The Witcher 1, 2, and 3, Horizon Zero Dawn, Kingdom Come Deliverance, Final Fantasy, Morrowind, Oblivion, The Fable Trilogy, and that's just naming a few. I love role playing games. Assassin's Creed Odyssey is not a good role playing game. It's a fucking bad one. And I know I'm gonna see the dislike skyrocket, which is also part of my point. Who is this game actually aimed at? People who have no interest in critiquing games. People who have no want to dig deeper and look at the narrative more closely, the gameplay mechanics, how things are balanced. The fans of this game purely want flashy colours, lots of XP every five minutes, and for anyone that doesn't like it to just shut up and simply not play it. But I'm sorry, that's not how this works. That's not how critiquing works. I loved Assassin's Creed, I love RPGs. This game makes a mockery of both, and you best be sure I'm going to voice that. I never spoke about about this when the game launched. I focused solely on what it did wrong with the lore, what it did wrong as part of the Assassin's Creed brand because, well that's my area of specialty and every other critic under the sun was talking about how it was the next Witcher 3. Did these people play The Witcher 3 or was it something you just had on in the background? Because The Witcher 3 fills its vast yet deep world with stories, with characters and with things to do that all feel meaningful, all of which have depth, all of which contain writing and acting on par with that of the main story and with the best games out there. It fills its world with heart, with soul, with character. Do you know what Assassin's Creed Odyssey does? None of those things. On the surface, sure, it has dialogue options like The Witcher, it has a perk system like The Witcher, it has side quests like The Witcher, it has locations to complete like The Witcher, but that's all it is. On the surface, all you have to do is play one quest from The Witcher 3 and one quest from Assassin's Creed Odyssey to see the stark contrast in quality levels, and my god if you can't I'm sorry but you're wrong. It's insulting to me that this botch job of a game is even compared to one of the all time greatest games ever made, a game that has immense love and care and passion and heart, it's insulting that these are even compared. But back on track, I wanted to tear myself from the rest and do something different for Assassin's Creed fans, but with the final DLC all done and dusted, with Odyssey seemingly now behind us, I felt it was time to let it all out. Pick apart this game once and for all and explain exactly why Assassin's Creed Odyssey is a fucking dreadful game. Okay, so let's talk about fundamentals of role-playing games. What do you need? First is a vessel to roleplay as in your roleplaying game. Now, there are two ways of doing this. Way number one is the Witcher way, which gives you a pre-established character with core character traits and you guide them through this world and through this story. You feel immersed in who they are. When you hit a dialogue tree, you choose what to say, but you aren't choosing whether you should be a good person or a bad person, you just choose an answer to give that's based on the character you're playing as. That kind of sounds complicated, so let me try and explain. In The Witcher 3, Geralt has core character traits. He's self-serving, yet caring to those he loves, 
he's brave, but also afraid to let his more vulnerable side show. Those are just a few character traits. These traits define the answers you can choose from. Every answer is always Geralt. Every answer fits into his core character. You're just choosing which one to go for. The second way is the Elder Scrolls approach. This gives you a full blank slate, completely blank. You name your character, you voice your character, and you pick choices to go for. These choices are not based on anything. They are purely different emotional answers. Kind, mean, sarcastic, ruthless, generous. You pick who you want to be in each encounter, and you base that on what you've built up for yourself in your mind for your completely blank slate of a character. Now, one thing you should never do is mix these. Because if you do, you're left with a pre-established character who has no character traits and flip-flops between one mood and another. A character that you can't make your own, but also isn't their own character. This is what Odyssey did. For a start, all dialogue is preset. It's gender neutral. Therefore, you get no quirks of male or female. As much as the media would like you to believe this isn't the case, men and women are different, and they act differently and say different things, and so that's a first step to achieving an awful protagonist. In Odyssey, like I said, they combined these two ways of serving a protagonist to the player. I played Cassandra, and I couldn't establish any core character traits, because there aren't any. Is Cassandra loving and kind? Well, she can be, and she can't be. I might choose to help someone out of kindness, and I might choose to call another a mean name. I might choose to help someone with their farm, but I also might choose to cuck out an old man and fuck his wife. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? This is wildly inconsistent. There is no character. Cassandra is not a character. You might comment, oh, here are Cassandra's core traits, but that's based entirely on your own choices, and when your own choices can be wild and erratic, you have no character foundation. You just have this empty husk who has a name and a face that you can't make your own, but a personality that you can have be whatever you want, at least in certain situations. If you're gonna have a pre-established character, you need to do the groundwork to build that character, to make them believable. You then guide them through the world, but regardless of your choices, it will always stay true to who that character is. But in this game, it's not the choice between being empathetic or ruthless, it's a choice between being entirely good or entirely evil, or somewhere in between. You can slaughter entire villages for Christ's sake. You cannot be attached to a pre-established character if that character has no core character traits. I can't feel for Cassandra the same way I can feel for Aloy or Geralt because the choices don't reflect one single character and different approaches that they might take. They just resemble random potential choices that anyone could take depending on who they are, which builds no connection between the player and the pre-established character. The reason this works when you give the player an entirely blank slate is because it allows you to put yourself into the role. In Skyrim, I'm playing myself, and the driving force of the game is the world that you're dropped into. You make your character. But when a game is doing half the work for you, giving you a character with a backstory, a name, a face, and then saying, oh, but they have absolutely no character, you just choose, it's at a huge disconnect. You can only have one or the other. If you go in between, it's lazy, and you miss the point of having a strong role-playing game if you miss the role-playing in role-playing game. Core pillar number two is dialogue. Touched on it briefly in the character section, but dialogue in Odyssey is... Well, not the dialogue itself, but the dialogue choices is my point here. Dialogue choices in games can go a few ways. So like I said, you either have the Elder Scrolls approach of most dialogue being world-serving, where you choose what you'd say because it's your character and that choice will then affect the quest. You have a system like The Witcher in which choices for sure can affect quests, but most of the time it affects relationships. It changes the way people perceive Geralt of Rivia, and then you have games like Mass Effect in which your dialogue basically serves as homemade character development. All dialogue for Shepard is fleshed out, but there are two extra options which you can only access if you go one way or the other on the morality scale. So if you choose a lot of empathetic options in dialogue, you'll slowly unlock Paragon options, which essentially works as character development. It takes Shepard from being his neutral self with, of course, his contained character traits to being a better, more good version of himself. Alternatively, you can go the other way and end up with Renegade, which is a more ruthless shepherd. All of these options, however, adhere to his core character tra or her core character traits because you can be both. In Assassin's Creed Odyssey, they sort of do some of these things and none of them. It's similar to my previous point, but the choices you have because of the way the character is set up, you'd think would work like Elder Scrolls, so your choices affect the world. You choose something, the quest goes a different way, which, sure, sometimes happens. You either 
kill an insignificant guard or you don't. It doesn't really matter, but it's a choice. And then sometimes, your choices are supposed to affect relationships, who joins your crew, if a certain character teams up with you or not, if someone wants to fuck you in a tent, I, this game is odd. The main point here being, they tried to use choice to shift narrative and character without having a character with core traits to tether that narrative to. That, that made sense to me, but that comes off as overly convoluted. Let me try again. The main point here being, they tried to make choice affect the way story flows for a character without first and foremost giving that character core traits with which to draw us in and link that character to the personal narrative that they're trying to tell, because initially they failed to establish a character with core traits for us to be invested in. The narrative itself doesn't work because the backstory and the motivations might not line up with the Cassandra or Alexios we've dreamed up for ourselves. It disconnects the player from the roleplay that they're trying to create. It doesn't let us ever fully immerse ourselves in the protagonist or in our own character as it sits awkwardly in between the two extremes. Therefore, choice often has no consequence, because trying to tell a story tethered to a character that we can shift at the drop of a hat means that the choices often need to feel drastically different, however cannot drastically affect the plot itself. This game flip-flops between trying to tell a straightforward linear narrative whilst also trying to allow choice. You see why this simply doesn't work? You can't show us flashbacks and establish Cassandra as a character whilst also saying you're allowed to choose whatever the fuck you want. If you want to be evil, you can, but it conflicts directly with the protagonist's fight against evil in Demos. In mocapped cutscenes where we see the protagonist without choice, exactly as the devs intended them to be, it can be wildly different from what we've been choosing as players. The difference then with The Witcher is that no matter which choice you pick, it's always Geralt. Geralt is a witcher, he's self-serving, he doesn't owe anybody anything, he's always been like that, but also, he has a caring side to him. You could choose to slay a beast purely for money. That's Geralt. You could choose to slay a beast for the people and ask for no reward. That's Geralt. In Odyssey, you can kill an entire town, fuck an old woman, and be the hero of the day. They all conflict, but they're all Cassandra. A canon character with no traits, no morals, nothing an empty husk, with a story we're meant to care about, with no traits and no values to tether them to the personal plot that we're supposed to be invested in. The choices do not enhance the story, they restrict the story and character, along with giving the illusion of free will. A good staple of any role-playing game is choice. We touched slightly on the theme of choice in the past two sections, but let's delve a little deeper. The main tagline for this game was, this isn't just any Odyssey, it's your odyssey, meaning you paved the way in this world and turned the story into your story. And that's a load of shit. Anyone who genuinely believes this, I'm sorry, but you're a moron. There might be one or two choices that genuinely do affect things. Whether certain characters die or not is the main one. Either you can save your family, or they die, and those are the main choices, but they don't really affect anything. They're very self-contained events, and that's not consequence of choice. I can slaughter an entire town, and there's no repercussions. Even Red Dead 1, which came out nine years ago, did this better. You kill one person, and there's minor consequences. Hell, even GTA did this better years and years and years ago. Even the older Assassin's Creed games gave your base actions consequences, but this game that prides itself on choice, on being your odyssey, can't. And I'm sure people will use the argument that, well, if you murder a town, then you get wanted and bounty hunters will try and kill you, but they won't if I look at the map and hold the Y button. Now they don't care because I paid digital money to nobody and I'm fine. It's a weird, unimmersive version of the notoriety system that's done a million times better in other games. Again, it's the way Quebec designed their games. It's illusion of consequence without having to bother to actually make consequences, and this translates into dialogue choices. For example, the first time I noticed this was right at the start. When you pick a horse, there's three to choose from, and you can ask about each one. No matter which one you end up choosing, Marcos gives you this line, and it's called Phobos. This is the one I want. Are you sure? I'm sure. Everybody benefits, especially you. You've chosen the great Phobos. He's never let me down. Phobos. But why? If your game actually had grand choice, you'd either just give us a single horse, like in The Witcher 3, or you'd provide an actual choice. The fact that the precedent set from the start of the game is that your choice doesn't matter is very strange to me. Now, the second major example, in stark contrast to the first, is the end of the game. Now the ending I got was a strange middle ending where my adoptive father Nicholas was alive, my mother Marini was too, but everybody else was dead. Now in any good RPG, any of the endings should be viable. For example, in The Witcher 3, there are a few endings and you could probably make a case for all of them being the right one because they're all equally thought out. However, the ending I personally got for Odyssey, 
I found hilarious. After everything that's happened, Cassandra is sitting in a family home with her mother and Nikolaus eating dinner. I, I laughed at the scene and then got a flood of comments saying that the ending being bad was my fault and that I didn't get the good ending because I made the wrong choices. But I thought this was my odyssey. I thought this was my story. And now I'm being told that the ending being bad was due to my choices. That's not good writing. That's dumb. If you have to make specific choices in order to get a satisfying ending, then why have choices at all? Just another example of choices being absolutely useless in this game. They're there purely to make the game look appealing to anybody on the outside. They don't actually serve a purpose. The story always ends the same. Cassandra has no growth due to these choices. She's always on one fixed path. No matter how many innocents you kill, how many goats you save, Cassandra is always on the same path. Linking back to earlier, I could spend my whole game slaughtering towns and then decide to execute a cultist because they're murdering innocents and, well, then my Cassandra will be a hypocrite. But that shouldn't be possible. But it is, because of the lack of care that goes into these choices. They don't consider all the options, and it, it shows. Okay, let's take a break from narrative and story, characters and whatnot, and discuss some of the mechanics. The leveling being a huge one. Odyssey is one of the most unbalanced games I've ever played. Every time you get a new main quest, it ends up being a few levels above you, and the damage difference between those levels is huge. On top of that, Odyssey has a fixed level scaling. You can't turn it off. It's always on, which is hilarious and just shows what they're trying to do. Let me explain. In most RPGs, level scaling is used for New Game Plus. You start New Game Plus and you don't want all the enemies to be level 1. It'll be too easy, so you whack on level scaling and all the enemies jump up to around your level, which makes New Game Plus more challenging, more fair, and more fun. In Odyssey, it's always on by default. Always. Now, surely you get what this means. It means that leveling up is pointless, unless quests are a higher level than you. It means if you're level 10, and a quest is level 10, there's no reason to level up, because the enemies will always level with you, and so there's no advantage to being a higher level. It means that if you level up, they level up, and so nothing changes. There is no balancing, it's just constant enemy level scaling, which shows their laziness. It shows how unbalanced and messy their stance system is, because if they allow for you to turn off level scaling, it would really show. You'd be able to see the vast difference in power levels, so instead of making a balanced experience, they just locked enemies to never be hugely weaker than you. Sure, you can turn level scaling to light, and it makes it a bit more lenient, but it's never vast. Origins didn't have level scaling, The Witcher 3 doesn't by default, and you don't really notice because of the quality and the balancing, far better in The Witcher 3, mind you. Whereas in Odyssey, there is a big gap between levels, and you never get to use the advantage of that, and there's good reason for this. This helps them push microtransactions. Why, you ask? Well, let's look at the other end of the scale. Leveling takes a while, and if you're as much as one or two levels below an enemy, they're gonna fucking destroy you. Enemies are huge damage sponges as it is. You have to keep fucking wailing on them, but if you're a couple levels below them, you do not stand a chance. Couple this with the fact that every few main missions, the quest level jumps about eight levels, and leveling up takes fucking ages, and the side quests are usually mundane fetch tasks that don't provide a lot of XP. You're left with no hope but to just cave and buy some fucking XP boosts, which is what this game is designed to do. I could try and take on Medusa. It'd just be way too difficult. Like, Medusa, I think, will be easier than the cultists. Because with the cultists, it's like, I have to fight them and beat them. And if I'm five levels under where they are, like, that's going to be tough. How much would it be if I got the microtransaction? I hate myself for buying into it. <sighs> right. I, no way, I did it. Why did it not? The fuck? What the fuck? Did you steal my money? I, d I did it already. Why do I only have 200? Yeah, it did go through. Where are my fucking Helix credits? Ubisoft just stole my money. Please tell me it works though, please. Please tell me they gave me my fucking... Oh, they did. Time savers, let's do it. XP. Permanent XP boost. Lovely. Okay, we have an XP boost. Wonderful. Let's see if it improves it greatly or not. I hope it does. Because if it doesn't, I'm going to be really upset. Look, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I had to give it. <laughs> oh, God. I kind of hate myself now, actually. Um, but, you know, that's the lesson I've learned here, I think. You see, recently they wanted to crack down on story creator mode quests that allow for XP farming. Not because they care about the integrity of the game. If they did, they wouldn't sell XP boosts. It's because they want to sell XP boosts. 
and the entire game is built around that. It plays like a free-to-play MMO, like a mobile game. You have loot boxes, you have special currencies and gems and helix credits. Everything takes ages to achieve and you can bypass that by spending money. Upgrading gear takes far too long because of the amount of fucking materials you need and you can buy that for real-life money. Everything is skewed. It's skewed in a way to make Ubisoft money, to take your money. Sure, you don't have to buy any of these packs or boosts, but the game suffers for it regardless because of how it's designed. And people buy these things. They're used to it. They'll buy into this system and Ubisoft will win. I remember the Nightmare Pack for Assassin's Creed Origins. We kicked up a fuss, nothing changed, and we even got people fighting back at us, not understanding the principle we were fighting against. Odyssey suffers greatly based purely on how it's designed and the game doesn't come first. It's designed around selling these extras. If the game was balanced, you wouldn't need to buy them, and so it has to be slightly unfair to the point where someone, even me, might cave and buy one. And it's terrible practice. There's a test that you can do, a test to see how good an open world is. Luke Stevens made a video on this where essentially you play a game for an hour, you capture footage, and then you watch the footage back and count how many times you got distracted by the world and how long was in between those events. How many times something of curiosity drew you in. I'll link his video down below. Now I tried this myself the other day on stream when I was playing Odyssey. I said, I'm just gonna walk. I'm just gonna see what catches my eye. I'm gonna be genuinely open to this and on the way to my next quest, see what draws me in. And well, I didn't. I never felt compelled to visit the 500th bandit camp in the game, or the 237th cave I'd seen, or walk through another copy and pasted town just to explore because I knew nothing would be there. I knew the locations would give me five objectives, to loot chests for gear I wouldn't use, to kill three captains, and then to give me 400,000 XP because I was level 99 and XP is arbitrary at this point. I knew the towns would be filled with lifeless NPCs that are copy, pasted, and procedurally generated, walking around in a soulless way in this town that had no care put into building it. And so I just ran in a straight line to my quest. I jumped off of cliffs and climbed huge mountains and just plowed my way forwards. There was no care for which direction to take because well, it doesn't matter, I have no full damage, so I can just go forwards, climb, jump down 100 feet and keep running and eventually reach my destination where I'd be told to collect things and then do it all over again. There's no connection to this world. It's not a world. There's no immersion here. Nothing to tether me to this world and the characters and the day-to-day -day life. I can't interact with anything or enter buildings of interest beyond empty houses with no life. I can't live in this world. I can't do anything beyond going from A to B to C to Z and seeing the same towns, the same NPCs, the same caves and camps and animals and mountains over and over and over again in this huge, vast, empty, shallow shell of an Assassin's Creed world. It gets to a point where it's fucking mind-numbing. You settle into this feeling constantly constant ambiguity. You can't tell two areas apart from each other. Everything starts losing identity and any sense of world building because they wanted to make the largest world possible and so the quality slowly dwindles until there's nothing. You start to see the numbers, you start to see the code that holds this game together because it's so bare bones, it's so basic. It's just this empty husk of taped together pieces filled with the same NPCs telling you to go and find things. There's no heart here, there's no life, it's just fucking dead. Let me give you an example. I'm gonna show you exactly what I mean. Let's compare walking through Athens, the biggest city of Greece in Odyssey, with a few other games. Let's see how the worlds compare. Τι 
αντιλαμβάνει η χώρα. Τέσσερι Sejeriet. Clear the way. Clear the way. Partner, Mister. Uh, and what do you want? Just give me a drink, quick. Alcohol is the only thing that makes the pain of life go away. Thanks for your time. Do you see it yet? Because if you don't, I... I don't know what to say. RPGs have side quests. Side stories that tell a narrative about a location, about a character. Odyssey has... Tasks. There are a few side stories, let's be fair. They try at times. You can see writers have an outline of a small narrative they wanted to tell. The main issue is in Odyssey's mechanics and structure and pacing. It gets in the way. For example, you have one quest line with the rebels on that island. I forget exactly what it was about, it was a while ago now, but essentially it was a group of rebels and you side with them and there was a love triangle for some reason, you could sort of fuck everyone because like you can always do that in Odyssey and it's useless and there's never a relationship or emotional connection. Like other RPGs, romances normally serve a purpose, but not in this, it's just mindless sexual encounters to pacify 13 year olds who play these games. But you could see there was a storyline, there was quite clearly a storyline. 
The writing was fine, I didn't have a huge issue, like it was a serviceable side story. The issue comes from its structure and pacing, and believe me when I say this is one of the very best side quests that Assassin's Creed Odyssey has to offer. This story that we're trying to tell gets bogged down by the go here, kill this mentality of Assassin's Creed Odyssey. The fact that every quest is go to a bandit camp, burn supplies, go to a fort, kill captains, go to this location, kill the official, collect supplies, burn 10 ships. And in between all of this is the mediocre dialogue with terrible animations and poor voice acting. How am I supposed to care about any of this? All of your side quest missions are just things that I can do in the open world. They're never unique. And the fact that this mentality for mission structure carries across to the main story is a fucking joke. Why is every single mission just tasks I can do in my free time? Imagine if the main missions in Assassin's Creed 2 were just collecting feathers or doing beat-up events. <laughs> Never any unique missions crafted simply because it was a mission. In Odyssey, you can go to forts and kill captains and burn supplies in the open world. But in missions, they make you do the same. Do you honestly think this is compelling level design? That this is compelling quest structure? This is fucking awful. It's fundamentally boring and it does nothing to captivate the player. Most of all, it's lazy. Lazy is how I would describe most of Odyssey. Perhaps that's what they were going for. Perhaps the point of this game is to be an MMO disguised as an RPG and I've missed that because this game misses the mark on every single thing that makes a role-playing game a role-playing game. It's superficial at best and downright terribly made at worst. Linking back to my points earlier about the world itself, this game focuses so hard on making the biggest world with the most shit to do that it fails to make the world deep, it fails to make the content substantial, and so it fails to be an RPG. Now, I could go in depth about every single aspect of this game. I could sit here and ramble on about the button mashy combat. I could sit and talk about the Icarus mechanic and how it serves no purpose anymore but to clutter the screen with icons for mundane repetitive objectives. But I have so many major topics to go over that it would just bog down the video to go in deep on any of these things, like the absolute state of these Mass Effect Andromeda looking animations and the budget Skyrim S voice acting. But I don't have time for it, so I guess I'll move on from the fact that you can choose to romance the head of the cultist during the climactic final confrontation or the fact the fact that procedurally generated NPCs can end up looking like white people wearing blackface. The fact the NPCs look like they're not part of the world itself, and for some reason the fire doesn't look as nice as Origins. I mean, what? why is this? How did they do this? I guess we should move on and stop lingering on things like the unnecessarily far away camera angle and the unimmersive running animation. Let's talk about some major topics. Okay, I'm really done with these minor things, let's move on. The cultist system. Probably the only thing in Assassin's Creed Odyssey that I can actually praise. I'm not going to here though, that's not the point of the video. Although I think the base system itself is interesting and could work if maybe scaled down and made in an actual Assassin's Creed game with Assassins and Templars, that's not enough. It still suffers from the same issues that plague Assassin's Creed Odyssey, padding. The system is disguised as a deep system which allows for you to track targets across a large world and take out these characters who are semi-developed, but they aren't. They have text on a page, sure, but these aren't characters. They're just people in masks dotted around the large map. So many of them all over the place, like 37 of them, and they're all the same. They have no personality, there is no dialogue, no cutscenes, no iconic Assassin's Creed confession. Just go to a location, kill a person, done. That's it. It's not good. It's vapid, and it serves purely to pad out the game. And again, it's another system in this game that gives the illusion of depth, which is a theme. It runs throughout this game. All of it serves to give the illusion of something without having to actually achieve that promise, and everyone eats it the fuck up. Now, I've gone over most of the main game's issues, the main things that I feel need to be addressed. I'm sure there's more, but these were the main things that I've seen being praised, and so these are the main things that I wanted to deconstruct. Following this, we have the DLC, the big expansions for Odyssey, the first of all being the Legacy of the First Blade. This was the first DLC of the two, and I've extensively gone over my issues with this DLC from the lore to the animations and structure, the downright mistakes, it's a fucking clusterfuck of shite. They get the AC lore wrong, they get real world history wrong, they kicked up a shitstorm from the LGBT community when they forced the protagonist to be straight, again displaying their lack of care for choice when the entire game was marketed on that premise. It took a homophobic act for the mainstream community to notice their fucking lack of care with the writing, their lack of consistency with writing. They hired some random bloke from EA to write Legacy of the First Blade? Why? Why did they think this guy could write the DLC which was based around Darius? They didn't even get the original writer of Odyssey. No wonder there are huge inconsistencies and no wonder they pissed off so many people who chose to make the character gay because they had just had that thrown back in their face and it's hilarious to see Ubisoft's true nature show. 
They just don't care. The canon of Assassin's Creed was a total shambles after this DLC in so very many ways. I'll link all of my videos on the issues down below, of which there are three. They're worth watching if you're interested, but I'll quickly list some. <laughs> Here we go. Darius, for some reason, dresses like an assassin and has a mandate like an assassin before the Brotherhood was created. It's very clearly just iconography for the sake of it at the expense of narrative integrity. The Leap of Faith was established in Origins as something that was important to Bayek, taught to him by his father, and then something he was going to teach to his son, which he couldn't due to his death, and so made it integral to the assassins. In the DLC, it canonizes that both Darius and Cassandra have been performing the Leap of Faith hundred years before Bayek lived, and also that they've been doing it without knowledge of the other, discrediting the emotional weight that Origins gave it, and suggesting that loads of people just happen to perform this iconic move. They make Aya from Origins the descendant of Cassandra, which makes no sense, given that Aya would have been of the same bloodline, even if it had been 100 years, she would have had a higher concentration of Isu blood than Desmond Miles, who only needed to be in the same room as a piece of Eden fruit to activate, yet it didn't for Aya or her son. They fucked up when the pyramids were built, like thousands of years off kind of fucked it up, and so many more. Like I said, videos on that are linked below. This just illustrates their lack of care, not just with Assassin's Creed, but in general. They do not care about consistency. The Fate of Atlantis, the second piece of DLC for Assassin's Creed Odyssey. The lore for this, we we don't even need to bother with that just yet, but holy fuck, just as a piece of paid content, this is appalling. Absolutely fucking appalling. The first episode was eight hours of nothing. They tried to give us a political struggle, yet failed on a huge level to make it intriguing or interesting, and instead gave us eight hours of nothing. It's classic Odyssey. You go from A to B to C and so on. Four hours, killing people, taking over forts, you find items. It's fucking terrible. The second episode was considerably shorter at just under half the length of the first, mainly consisting of the same shit though. You spend time getting armor, going into tombs and pressing a button next to a tablet and rinse and repeat. All the while with this background story of the modern day character of Layla Hassan trying to learn how to use the staff of Hermes through Cassandra and at the same time it's corrupting her but we'll get into the narrative a little bit later on. Then we have episode 3. You finally get to go to Atlantis where yet again we have a badly written political struggle of the Isu but this isn't real but it also is real. They don't do a hugely great job at explaining why we are where we are and how much of it is real and how much is false. And so this DLC has you level up a knowledge meter, which, oh boy, we'll get into that when we delve into the lore, but you need to level up this knowledge meter by doing four hours of mundane tasks, like going into tombs, opening chests. It's the classic Odyssey grind fest for absolutely no reason. And that's the whole DLC. That's what people paid for. The fact that any of this content cost money is quite frankly disgusting. They pushed out this skeleton of a DLC full of padding and nonsensical storytelling to justify their grindy gameplay in order to take money from you. It's just... I, I have no words, it's just scummy practice. You can tell they don't care about telling a story by the fact they keep switching out their writers for DLC because they just want to push something out. <sighs> right, I guess we should talk about the lore, the story, and what the fuck they've done with this clusterfuck mess of a DLC. First things first, like I explained, the story is Layla in the modern day after the events of the main game. She has the staff of Hermes and needs to learn how to use it. The voice within the staff is an Isu called Alethea. She guides Layla and uses Cassandra's memories in order to teach Layla, which Fine, whatever, that's a setup. You have your usual messy animations with poor acting, and then we do episode one. Episode one doesn't do a whole lot, nothing egregious with the story here, just sort of meh. We then move on to episode two. So for some reason, the staff is making Layla evil. I guess it makes sense given that the apple made Amwalim fucked and the same for Abbas. So it makes sense that people who don't have Isu DNA get corrupted by pieces of Eden. It's not exactly a well-made and developed storyline, we just sort of see Layla being angry a lot, and there isn't a proper descent. We also can't sympathise with her, which is odd considering we're playing as her. There's no legwork done for these characters or story, and so it falls flat, and moments like this, which I'm sure were meant to be impactful, come off as fucking hilarious. Let's go. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> She fucking ragged on like crazy! What do you mean, Gab? You just smacked her across the fucking room with a magic staff! What? <laughs> what is this? 
Then we move on to episode 3, and oh my fucking god, how did this even get made? So I already talked about the horrible, grindy gameplay, but excuse me for a moment while I go full AC YouTuber and just go in on this terrible misrepresentation of the lore. So from the get-go, we're told about the Sixth Sense, a sense that the Isu have. Now, people have thought for some reason that this was Eagle Vision, but it isn't. I know in Assassin's Creed 1, the Animus Lady calls it a Sixth Sense, but it's not THE Sixth Sense. It's complicated for sure, but we've known about this Isu Sixth Sense since about Assassin's Creed 2. It's actually the Isu's ability to see time and read time and use that data. That's how they knew Desmond would be where he was, viewing Ezio's memories and what time they would be there so that they could leave messages. It's how they contact humans, it's how Minerva built her eye device which saves the world. It's explained properly in Origins and then completely thrown away in Odyssey. For some reason, they simply refer to the sixth sense as knowledge. Now for some reason, people have been sending me this clip from Assassin's Creed Brotherhood in order to justify this. Just let me play it for you. You with five senses, us with six. The one we kept from you, to be safe. Now you can never know, only try, grasp. You can see, smell, taste, touch, hear. Knowledge has been locked away. Basically, Juno says that knowledge on the sixth sense has been locked away from humans, which tells us two things. One, it's not eagle vision, as humans have eagle vision and it's solely a human trait, and also that this sixth sense is an Isu trait, and it's been locked away from humans. Now, believe it or not, people have been using this clip to try and say, look, Juno once said that it's knowledge, so Odyssey is right. You, you can't be serious, right? I'm being pranked, surely. Do you take everything people say at direct face value? Do you think Juno is saying that knowledge has been locked away literally, like in a box somewhere with a padlock? There's just knowledge in there, just the physical representation of knowledge. Obviously not, it's metaphorical. She's saying that knowledge of the sixth sense has been locked away from humans. But I guess Quebec took it at face value too. Look, we've got a bit deeper into this than I wanted to, but I was trying to illustrate that this DLC was marketed as the Odyssey DLC for AC fans. This will be for people who love the lore. But the lore is all wrong. It's a mess. It doesn't respect Assassin's Creed. It makes a mockery of it. Juno shows up with Aita and it's fucking weird. It makes no sense. Nothing here has consequence because it's merely a distorted memory of the Isu. So what was any of this? Surely this didn't happen, because then why would Juno have been made a member of the Capitoline Triad? Why would she be researching how to save the world if they didn't trust her from this early on? It makes no sense. This whole DLC is a strange, obscure depiction of Isu worlds. Why is everybody Greek? Why is there an underworld? Why do they say Malacca? Why does Ares get angry when you kill his dog? Surely this dog wasn't real in actual AC lore and history. None of this makes any sense. Quebec seemed to be confusing myth with truth. When it comes to Assassin's Creed, the Isu weren't myths, they weren't gods, they didn't have magical powers, they were just a really advanced race that lived on Earth before humans. They created humans, they made technology like the pieces of Eden, and the temples we find are left behind from their civilization. It's intriguing because there's no magic, because it's all grounded in science and reality. When you start adding huge demon monsters and three-headed dogs and werewolves, it just becomes a shit show, and that's exactly what you've done. This DLC. Both DLCs, this entire game, every piece of content included is the strangest patchwork mess of RPG mechanics, of an MMO approach, microtransactions like a mobile game, vague Assassin's Creed lore which tries to connect to the previous games enough only to justify its existence and sell copies to Assassin's Creed fans. Its repetitive gameplay plagues every single quest, animation and dialogue serve only to make a joke of everything, the tonal inconsistencies throw me every time. Are we meant to take this seriously? Is this a serious story in the Assassin's Creed universe? Is this a joke in the Assassin's Creed universe? Is this making a mockery of Assassin's Creed lore? Or is this trying to use it the best that they can but they don't know what they're doing? It's all of these things. And none of them. I wanted one last time to pour what passion I had left for this franchise I once deemed my all-time favourite into a piece of writing. And so, I guess if this is the last time I'm going to talk about this in a video, in a constructed manner, outside of tweets here and there, discussions on podcasts, or drunk rants on live streams, I might as well make it worth it. I loved Assassin's Creed. I love what it stood for. Its themes, its complex narrative, its interweaving of characters, stories, and settings. 
I love the music, the power it held, the fact I could feel so emotionally tied to these characters simply through music, the mythos of the ones who came before, their ties to the war between the Assassins and the Templars, the mysterious pieces of Eden and the temples from this old civilization woven with the creed of this ancient order of Assassins that fought against tyranny and injustice, the way you could just embody that role of somebody working from the shadows to serve the light, the fact that the opposing order was never plainly evil. The grey areas for both orders were incredibly interesting, and how that linked to the narrative of the first Civ was even more so. The world's history felt real and grounded. We could explore these worlds and be immersed in their environment, whether it be the harsh, hostile world of the Third Crusade or the colourful tropics of the Caribbean, maybe the central city of Rome and the conflict that came with being in such a place, or the deserts of ancient Egypt brought to life and turned into its own character. I can't ever leave behind what Assassin's Creed did for me. As much as I say and proclaim that I don't care, it's not true. Of course I care about what I had, about what it meant. I care about what they do wrong, I care about the lack of care displayed by the company that owns the brand that I loved, of course I care. But I think it's fair to say that although I care about what I once had, and that I care about how much this franchise meant to me, I don't hope anymore that it'll get better. That somehow it'll resurrect because that's ridiculous, it's long dead. I don't even necessarily want good games. I think it's fair to say that I don't care what they do. It's more that I miss what was. I miss the old direction, the old purpose, I miss Assassin's Creed, and this really is a message to all of you, to Ubisoft and to myself. Although Assassin's Creed had been flip-flopping for years, it never quite felt as ruined as it does now. I never felt the way that I did after finishing the final Odyssey DLC because not only did Odyssey dismantle the brand, it made a mockery of it. It showed blatant disregard for a franchise that I loved, it took the lore and used it for contrived storytelling mechanics, it used iconic lines of dialogue as cheap fan service for no reason, it told a vacant story in a shallow world to make money and nothing more. Not only is Odyssey not a good game. Not only does it fail to be a strong RPG or a quality game in its own right, it's worse than that. Because... Well, because it's Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Thanks for watching.